Good morning, everyone. I welcome you all to this Pune Radiology and the Music Association first session at Ruby Hall. I am very much touched by the enthusiasm shown by all the residents to attend my lecture. However, due to some organizational commitment, I am not been able to be physically present in your lecture. However, I would try to make it as interesting as I would have made it personally. Firstly, we need to know why we should learn about table viva. What is the need? What is the purpose? As Agent Smith in the famous movie Matrix would say, what is the purpose? So let's take few scenarios, especially for our final radiology examinations. This is a standard scorecard in the RGHS university examination where the total marks in the practicals are 400 and the distribution of marks is for spotters it is 60 marks long case 100 marks two short cases of 50 marks each that is amounting to 100 marks film reading session of 60 marks and then the instruments of 25 marks table viva of 50 marks and the communication has been given as five marks. So total it accounts to 400 marks. Let's see for a student who has scored really good in the spotters. He got, he managed to score 56 out of 60 marks. However, he could not perform very well in the long case because his long case maybe was difficult or he could not cling onto that correct diagnosis. He could not describe the findings accurately. The short case was also not too great. The film reading session was okay. He could score 50% of the marks, but in the instruments, he barely scored 10 out of 25. In the Viva, he scored 15 out of 50 marks. He was allotted, say for example, four marks by the examiner for his communication, but still he could not make it to that 50% mark. Whereas another student with similar marks in spotters, long case, short case, film reading session. Now over here, he has scored really well in the instruments and in the Viva and he could comfortably manage to pass. Another student over here scored similar marks. He could not do really well in long case, short case but he could perform really well in the viva in the instruments and he simply managed to sail through another student he is not performing good in any of the heads except for the table viva and instruments he is performing very poorly in the spotters so he could not pass that is the significance of spotters, instruments, table viva. That is, I am going to emphasize. If you really want to pass, if you really want to go through the 50% mark, you should emphasize on the spotters, table viva, instruments. And long case, short case definitely are a major chunk of the practicals. You cannot skip that, but yes, if the luck doesn't go in your favor, you might not get good marks in that. But instruments, table viva, spotters are very scoring part of the practical examination. So you should not miss out on these marks. That is the purpose of this whole lecture. Let's take another scenario for a DNB examination where in sp place of spotters, we have OSCE. Table viva is of 40 marks, short cases are of 40 marks, long cases, two long cases, 35 marks each account amounting to 70 marks and the total practical is 300. So OSCE is a major chunk of the DNB practicals. If you can crack the OSCE correctly, you can definitely pass there itself. 
with table viva and oski alone you can easily sail through we have multiple examples over here this candidate is just barely getting 50 percent marks in oski he's performing very poorly in the table viva in short cases long cases he's just getting 50 percent of the marks but still he cannot pass because he's performing so badly in the table viva another candidate doing really well in the OSCE and table viva. He has got 130 marks here itself. And even if he gets 10 and 10 marks in the long case and short case, he is definitely going to sail through. Another scenario, just basic for 50% performance in the OSCE and table viva. He is not performing that great in short cases and long cases also. Simply just missing the passing percentage. Again, emphasizing on the value of OSCE and table viva. Table viva and OSCE simply makes him pass and he gets 10, 10 more marks in the long cases and short cases, which are very easy to score. He will definitely sail through. So DNB practicals, RGOHS practicals are not very difficult, but you should know exactly how you should score marks. You should emphasize more on the spotters, OSCE, table viva, and in the long cases and short cases, you should exactly know how to describe, what to describe, and have some pertinent differentials in your mind. So by these case scenarios, what do you understand is the purpose of this table viva? The purpose of our PG is to first become a good radiologist. And in order to achieve that purpose, we need to be the chosen one passing the examinations. In MD, the ex passing the examination might not be very difficult, but it has to be done by you. DNB practicals are very difficult because it is an alien center. They are ready to fail you. In any go, you exactly need to know what you are supposed to speak and then only you can pass. So to become a good radiologist, firstly, we won't need to become a radiologist. For that, we need to pass in the practical examinations as well. So coming on to this lecture, what all do we have in table viva, which can help us in passing the examinations? There are general viva topics like PCP and DT, AERB, ELORA, thesis methodology, various radiography material, barium and related procedures, instruments and intervention, conventional and interventional procedures, various contrast media, and the drugs like adrenaline, atropine, AVIL, etc. used in radiology. In this lecture, in this next 40 to 45 minutes, I will try to cover the high yielding topics in table viva which are very very commonly asked however i cannot cover everything in a single lecture so the next time i will be covering the next of the remaining table viva items in second part of this lecture so in radiographic material we have grades x-ray tube beam restricting devices filters tld patch cash head, CR cases, drive view film, thermal paper roll, processing, screen, image intensifier, factors, surface landmarks, pressure injectors, conventional LED view box. The list seems to be exhaustive, but I can assure you there are not more than 15 to 20 questions on each of these items. So if you just remember around 10 to 15 facts about each of this radiography material, you can get more than 80% marks in the table viva and that is for sure. The high yield table viva items are grid, x-ray tube, cassettes, flims, intensifying screen, TLD patch, ultrasound gel. These are asked to almost all the candidates. So you should not miss out on these. And as I give tips to everyone for examinations, what are the various items you should carry for examination? Firstly, 
carry your mental peace. Don't be stressed out. Because when you're in stress, you're not able to perform appropriately, aptly. Even when you're no, you're not able to recall. That's why be at mental peace. And there are some obligatory requirements like admit card, ID proof, coffee of your thesis. Happen. Don't forget that. Be comfortable, be calm, composed and poised. Have peace of mind. That is first and foremost thing in any examination. So you have arrived at the table viva. There are multiple table viva items kept in front of you. The examiner is sitting at you. He's looking at you. Now, what he will say? Most of the examiners simply ask the candidate, pick up anything. And then the candidate is looking for what to pick up. He has never made up, made up his mind that, oh, I should, when I am asked, I should pick up this thing because they are not aware of the exam scenario. They have never experienced it earlier. So you should make up your mind that, yes, if I am asked to pick up anything, I will pick up a grid or ultrasound gel or a iodinated contrast media or whatever you are comfortable with, whatever you are confident about. So let's, this candidate has picked up a radiographic grid. So he will ask you, what is it? There are two ways of answering in a table viva. Either you can simply start answering or you can wait for the examiner to speak. But it is always better to start speaking automatically. You should utter every pertinent radiographic terminology, whatever you know of, in one go. Because the time at each table is limited, there will be a buzzer after five to seven minutes. So you will not be given more than that time. And the examiner has got a very short time to assess you. So you need to speak fluently and fastly and with confidence because you have already prepared for it. So when you have picked up this grid, what you will say? Most of the candidates say, sir, this is a grid. We use it for X-ray. And the answer is totally substandard. So what we are supposed to speak, we are supposed to speak like this. Sir, this is a radiographic grid of a grid ratio 8 is to 1. It is a focused type of radiographic grid. Radiographic grid consists of series of lead foils separated by a radiolucent spacer. The interspaces of the grid are filled with either aluminum or some organic compound. The function of the grid is to allow the primary radiation to pass and to prevent the scatter radiation from reaching the image receptor. And hence, it improves the image contrast. Each of this word exactly as it is, you should reproduce in the examinations. Now, how do I know that the grid ratio is eight is to one? See, at the lower aspect of grid, there will always be a label and there will always be a line in the center of the grid. If you will, if you read this, when you pick up this grid, you should read it. Over here, the ratio is 6 is to 1 because in our table viva, the grid kept is at 6 is to 1. But most commonly, in most of the table viva, you will find the grid ratio to be 8 is to 1 because it is the most commonly used grid. So over here, what information do we get? The interspatial material is aluminum size you can judge it is 17 by 14 inch what is this lines this is the grid frequency fd is focal distance that is 100 centimeters or one meter the grid ratio is 6 to 1 so that is what is you need to utter that the grid ratio is this and when you have been mentioned as the focal distance 100 centimeters it means it is a focus type of grid so over here we have a grid ratio of 6 to 1 it is a focus type of grid and the interspace Material over here is aluminum. You can exactly say like this. And don't forget to mention the function of the grid. The function of the grid is to allow the primary radiation to pass and to prevent the scatter radiation and improving the image contrast. Then the next question is like, what is the upper side of the grid? The examiner may keep asking you, but you should not let him speak. It's better that you speak. You should simply say, sir, next, this is the upper side of the grid. 
as it is the label side and there are markings on the upper side. There can be single marking on the cent as per the center line or there can be two markings. We align the grid that the center of the grid and the center of the cassette should align and the long axis is always along the long axis of the table. You can simply see this and these are used when the part thickness is more than 10 centimeters KVP is more than 80 centimeters and we have a large OVB. Commonly, as in cases of radiograph of abdomen, skull, lumbar spine, lateral view, and contrast studies like I view, MCU, RGU, and barium studies, etc. Okay, this is it. This is what you need to speak. This is what you're supposed to speak in one go. Don't speak about anything else. Okay. If he asks you, where where are the situations where you don't use the grid and you remove the scatter radiation? What technique you use? Then in case there is a technique known as air gap technique in which we increase the gap between the patient and the image receptor, thereby reducing the amount of scatter radiation reaching up to the image receptor. He can then ask you what is grid ratio. Then you have to say the grid ratio is the ratio of the height of the lead strips to the distance between them. Okay. It is generally the denominator is always kept as one because to maintain uniformity in comparing the ratios as simple as that. So this is the grid ratio height upon the distance. Then he might ask you what are the various types of grids. Then you can simply say, sir, the grids can be divided as per the grid pattern, grid orientation and grid movement. Based on the pattern, there can be linear or cross grids. Based on the orientation, they can be focus or parallel grids. And based on the movement, it can be stationary or a moving grid, also known as Bucky. A moving grid is known as Bucky. So how do you evaluate grid function? There are various parameters like, I remember as P, B, C, okay? primary transmission, Bucky factor, contrast improvement factor. As far as practicals are concerned, you might not be asked this much, but you should remember if possible, if you want to really score more than 80% in table by bar. So what is primary transmission? It is percentage of radiation transmitted through grid. Okay, what is Bucky factor? It is incident radiation upon the transmitted radiation. And contrast improvement factor, what happens with grid? Grid improves the contrast. That is the purpose of the grid. So with grid, the contrast improves. So it is a ratio of contrast with grid upon contrast without grid because contrast with the grid is going to be higher than contrast when you are not using the grid, okay? So what are the disadvantages of grid? You can simply speak it in the first sentence only that we have to increase the exposure factors, which results in higher patient dose. And there can be sometimes artifacts known as grid cutoff. Okay. So we, as we know that when we are using a grid, we have to increase the exposure factors and patient doses increases. Now he might ask you if he's an very old time or examiner, he might ask you, what is a grid cassette? Many of you, even we have not seen grid cassettes, but these are special, this used to be special types of X-ray cassettes used for portable radiography when the grid was actually built along with the cassette. So you might not find it on the table viva, but the examiner might ask you, what is a grid cassette? So what is moving grid? It is also known as Porter Bucky grid. It was discovered by Porter. Okay. So what is the purpose of uh, uh, Porter Bucky grid? Actually, this whenever there is a radiograph being taken and the X-ray machine is on, when we press the switch, the grid motion Bucky automatically start oscillating and it helps in removing the grid lines from the film. Okay. So what can be the disadvantages, you know, it removes the grid lines. Okay. And uh, what the disadvantages? It is costlier and this motor, which is oscillating or moving the Bucky can fail, can result in artifacts. Obviously with use of grid, we have increased patient dose and whenever there is a motion, there is a vibration. So not, don't go so much into the disadvantages. Firstly, it is prone to mechanical 
failure secondly it is costly so every examiner asks you what are the other ways of reducing scatter radiation because scatter radiation is undesirable we don't want scatter radiation scatter radiation reduces the film contrast or causes film fog so what are the other techniques we have beam restricting devices in the form of cone cylinders aperture diaphragm etc and there is one more technique known as air gap technique it can be asked to you as such also so what happens in this the focal film distance is increased uh, to maintain the sharpness and the patient and the image receptor distance is also increased so that less of the scatter radiation from the body part reaches up to the image receptor where do you use uh, air gap technique in cervical spine lateral view so what are the various grid artifacts this the examiner might not might not ask because uh, this is very long answer relatively he might ask you if a focus grid is placed upside down upside down the upper portion of the grid is placed on the lower side what will happen then you have to say sir the in this case the x rays will pass only through the center the image will be formed only in the center and in the periphery there will be grid cut off as simple as that what is ideal grid something ideal means it is functioning with 100% efficiency so ideal grid is which allows all primary radiation to pass and prevents all scatter radiation but in practice it doesn't happen because a grid generally prevents some primary radiation also and in spite of grid there is some scatter radiation which reaches up to the film what is grid frequency it is simply lines per inch and the value always remains around 103 that is it you need to remember for every table viva equipment examiner might ask you the price or the cost there is a difference between price and the cost that is actually a financial term the best nomenclature is actually price but leaving everything behind we are not into finances we are into radiology so you should remember what is the price of the grid the price of the grid is 4000 rupees for a 17 by 14 inch size grid and you should always use the word approximately 4000 rupees so that gives you an idea that you know almost everything about the grid okay so so much of uh, uh, knowledge about radiography and grid just to refresh your mind please identify this monument and in which city it is located please take around 15 seconds for it i i am sure that most of you must have identified it correctly it is hawa mahal in jaipur when you are in this hawa mahal you feel a relaxing cool breeze of air coming from all sides so just relax your mind a little bit then we'll go on to the next table by by item beam restricting devices and you might find a cone or a cylinder or a aperture diaphragm on the table by by table okay so what is actually a beam restricting device it is a device it is or you can simply say it is a radiographic device which is attached to the opening of the x ray tube housing and which regulates the size and shape of the x ray beam so it is divided into three categories aperture diaphragm cone and cylinder and collimators so when you have when you see such table viva item on the x ray table viva what you will say you will say sir this is a cone or this is a cylinder no that is the incorrect way of speaking you will say sir this is a cone type of beam restricting device it is used to prevent the scatter radiation and hence improve the image contrast you should utter everything verbatim like this okay so what is the function to function is to prevent the scatter radiation and to reduce the patient exposure so what is the construction of it you will say sir the base is made up of lead and the body is lined with copper with aids in absorption 
collimators are sheets of lead you will generally not find collimators in the table viva okay and in ct scans we also use something known as post patient collimator so what happens collimators are uh, available in front of the patient and at the back of the patient also after the x-ray beam passes through the patient so pre and post patient collimators are used in ct scans does the exposure factors change with the use of beam restrictors yes as for we see we saw that in grades a little bit of exposure factors have to increase to maintain the film density now this is the most important table viva item so what is it he will ask to pick up anything what is it so a candidate tends to pick up the large bulky x-ray tube will you pick up that large bulky x-ray tube on a, during the examinations it is made up of pyrex glass it can just slip from your hands and fall down this can be catastrophic so never 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 try to pick up this x-ray tube you know you are sure that it is a x-ray tube so why do you need to pick it up you don't need to pick it up okay see it from there you know it is a x-ray tube so now what you will speak i have seen many of the students they just simply say so this is a x-ray tube this is a very absurd way of answering in the table viva you have to be more technical you have to be more scientific in speaking so what you will say you will say sir this is a rotating anode type of x-ray tube it has it has various components the cathode assembly is negatively charged and generates the electron beam the long stem is the rotating anode which is positively charged and has a target track the glass envelope is made up of pyrex or silica it has got a thin portion from where the x rays can come out or you can say it has got a window from where the x rays can come out and there is a protective metal housing made up of lead which is not seen here but it is seen in the uh, x-ray tube when it is actually being used so he might ask you what is the anode side and cathode side if you have not told during the examination so what you will see the projecting longer side is generally the anode because it contains the long stem of the rotating anode and what happens the rotating anode has a target and what hits the target the electrons electrons are negatively charged okay a negatively charged particle is always attracted towards the positive charge so the polarity of the anode in x ray tube has to be negative or positive all of you tell me the anode is positively charged or negatively charged the anode is positively charged that's why the electrons are attracted towards the target anode and they strike against the target anode okay and what about the cathode it creates the electron beam so it has to be negatively charged okay so rotating anode has two parts it is made up of the anode disc and the anode shaft what about the target track or the anode disc what is the construction it is made up of tungsten and we have a molybdenum core backed with graphite okay now it is not simply tungsten nowadays they are using tungsten rhenium alloy so what is this tungsten rhenium alloy tungsten 90% plus 10% of rhenium why do we use this alloy to reduce pitting because tungsten alone will have lot of pitting you have older x-ray tubes you might have seen it is having pitting okay so why do we use tungsten tungsten have a very high atomic number so it has got a very high melting point also so what is the melting point of tungsten it is 3370 degrees celsius as mentioned in christensen's okay so in some books or in wikipedia or radiopedia you might find different values so don't get perturbed by that 
some places you might have been mentioned like it is 3400 degree celsius 3500 degree celsius doesn't matter the exact value what you need to remember is 3370 degree celsius and it is a good conductor of it that is it so what is the role of molybdenum head it helps in reducing the weight because tungsten is heavy and helps in the heat dissipation what is the role of graphite mount it again helps in reducing the weight and helps in heat dissipation again now anode shaft it is made up of molybdenum so here it says we are saying it is a good conductor of heat it is molybdenum is helping in heat dissipation but in the books you will find it prevents heat conduction to the bearings and hence their damage in turn leading to longer tube life what is this meaning actually it is such a good conductor of heat that it just conducts the heat outwards and it doesn't allow the bearings to get become very hot that's why the bearing are not so much damaged and hence the tube light is increased okay now this is a very common question if somebody is on a sinking ship he might be simply asked when will x ray is discovered okay so x rays were discovered on 8 november 1895 by wilhelm conrad ronchen should know how to speak this you should know what the spelling of this he is the father of radiology and on this day of his discovery 8 november it is celebrated as the international day of radiology worldwide he was the recipient of the first nobel prize in physics in 1901 okay now this date his birth date you might not remember but if you want if you have remembered everything else you might like to remember it as 27 march 1845 and he died on 10th feb 1923 due to epithelial cell cancer and these last two uh, facts are not essential to be remembered his wife's name was uh, anna bertha ronchen you might remember but what is more important is then when the first radiograph in the world which was taken was of his wife's hand and when she saw this radiograph she said that i have seen my death when she saw this radiograph okay so what is the construction of anode target uh, rhenium target track so tungsten rhenium target track we have already seen molybdenums we just revising it surrounds the tungsten target area and then graphite mount it again reduces weight assistant heat dissipation okay you should remember this uh, construction very very well and cathode has what cathode is negatively charged electrode as i showed because it is the place where electrons are being created because by thermionic emission so it has two parts what filament and a focusing cup so a uh, filament is generally made up of what thoriated tungsten okay remember this thoriated tungsten the target trait is tungsten rhenium alloy filament is made up of thoriated tungsten and what are the dimensions dimensions of filament diameter of the wire which is we use is 0.2 mm very thin it's less than 1 mm so diameter of wire is 0.2 mm we have a spiral of 2 mm and the length is just 10 mm so remember everything in mm in certain books it is written as 0.2 mm 2 mm and 1 cm it confuses everything so when you are using a particular unit you stick to that so diameter of the wire is 0.2 mm spiral diameter is 2 mm and the length is around 10 mm that is hardly 1 cm it is just 1 cm okay and now what this focusing cup focusing cup what is the purpose of focusing cup when there is a thermionic emission there is a electron cloud all around and when the electrons leave the filament they might leave go anywhere but we need to have a focusing cup so that we can target it onto the tungsten rhenium target track okay we don't want the electron beam to go hey wire anywhere on the target we just want it to reach up to the 
target track which is made up of tungsten rhenium alloy so we have a nickel focusing cup as simple as that nothing more than that is required now what is dual filament now this all the x-ray tubes which are coming up this modern x-ray tubes which are coming up they are having dual filament what is the purpose we have a larger filament over here we can see and we have a smaller filament so we will remember only about the large so larger filament has a larger focal spot it is used for larger body parts and it has got a low resolution okay so generally old and x-ray tubes used to have a larger filament only there was never a smaller filament but why do we need a smaller filament for better resolution simple as simple as that and it can be used for a smaller body parts easy to remember okay the current is generally same in both the tubes that is 10 volts 3 to 5 3 to 7 amperes so we have tungsten as a filament because it has got a very high melting point it can be converted into wires it has a good tensile strength and it is a very good electron emitting efficiency. So what is X-ray tube anode? As I told, it is positively charged. There can be two types of X-ray tube anode. So when we saw this X-ray tube, we said this is a rotating type of X-ray tube. Sorry, this is a rotating anode type of X-ray tube. Okay, so completely speak this term. So if we have a rotating type of X-ray tube, naturally we are having something which is not rotating. So then what is it? It is a stationary anode type of X-ray tube. You might also get a, you, it is a very small tube like this, of this size, like this, this image is there. I'll show later. So there can be stationary or rotating and the anode, anode material tungsten rhenium. And what about mammography tubes we have? molybdenum and rhodium. So how does this rotating anode rotate? By magnetic field produced by the stator coils. That's it. You should remember this thing. The rotating anode rotates by the magnetic field produced by the stator coils. Okay. Nothing more than is required in table by one. What is advantage of rotating anode? When we have a stationary anode, it is being bombarded continuously at the same place, but we have a rotating anode. There is heat dissipation over a larger area and the focal spot remains the same. Over here, you can see we have this 140 millimeter disc, which is rotating continuously and the target thread is, is hardly 4 millimeter. So we have heat dissipation over larger area. Whereas in a stationary anode type of X-ray tube, it is continuously being bombarded. So the heat dissipation is not that much. That is why these stationary anode tubes are utilized when in, in applications where we don't need a lot longer exposures. Okay, what are the various disc diameters? 75, 100, 125, 140. What is anode shaft? Okay, we know it is made up of molybdenum, as simple as that. And then we have uh, ball bearings, etc. Now, what is the lubricant we use for anode ball bearings? These are metallic lubricants, metallic silver or metallic lead. Just remember this, nothing more than that is required. Now, this is a smaller, this, you, this is a smaller tube of this much length. It is a stationary anode type of x-ray tube and the anode is made up of tungsten target embedded in a large copper wire okay as we can see over here now only dental x-ray machines use stationary anode type of x-ray tube and if you have some older portable x-ray machines in your department they might be using the stationary type of anode however in all the modern uh, portable x-rays also you will find rotating anode type of x-ray tubes okay remember this now you might be asked what is line focus principle so it is actually a balance between a large focal spot which provides a 
over large focal spot and a small focal spots so over here the actual focal spot or the electron beam size is around 4 mm but whereas the effective focal spot becomes 1 mm because of the line focus principle okay so generally the focal spot or this target angle is around 6 to 20 degrees okay so what happens when we have a angulated focal spot so what happens when the electron beam strikes the tungsten rhenium target ray the intensity on the cathode side is high and the anode heel effect that is the intensity on towards the anode side is reducing reducing and reducing so what we are supposed to do when we are doing say for example x-ray of a limb we can keep the thicker part towards the cathode and the thinner part towards the anode so just to simplify anode heel effect is the reduction in the intensity of x-rays towards the anode side so what should we do the beam intensity over here is less it will have less penetration so we can keep the thinner part towards the anode side as simple as that okay so what are the various interactions between x-rays and matter you should just remember these terminology in table five nothing more will be asked to you coherent scattering photoelectric effect, compton scattering pair production and photo disintegration okay what are the non-medical uses of x-rays we have all gone to airport at airport security we have seen x-ray machines being used then they are used in industry then used in x-ray crystallography x-ray astron astronomy and if you have gone to some museums where you have found egyptian mummies you must have seen their radiographs also over there so in museum they are used for uh, picturing these mummies and for preservation of artifacts and paintings now why does this x-ray tube glass becomes brown because of deposition of tungsten vapors okay as simple as that it is known as rk and you might be asked what is the wavelength of x-rays i have seen candidates who just forget it during the examination so just remember this figure 1 angstrom, 2.1 angstrom or if you want to remember it otherwise as per your convenience 0 0.1 to 1 angstrom as simple as that 1 angstrom is equal to 10 to the power minus 10 meters so don't get into the details of that the wavelength of diagnostic x-rays is 1 to 0.1 angstrom different books have given different values don't bother about that just remember the simplified value okay so there is a, always uh, you can be asked about the difference between mammography tubes and x-ray com commonly used x-ray tubes so what is the difference over there now many candidates say that the mammography tubes are stationary type of tubes no the all the latest mammography tubes are using rotating anode type of x-ray tubes okay remember this thing and the target Target track is made up of molybdenum. We use a molybdenum filter. It is known as the MOMO tube. Okay. And this characteristic radiation is at 18 and 20 kilo electron volts. We have a tube window made up of beryllium. Remember this for a routine mammography tube. But nowadays, as X-ray tube have dual target, these mammography tubes can also have dual targets. Okay. So we can have a MOMO type tube or MO ROHO tube type of tube that is molybdenum rhodium type of tube okay so if the brush thickness is more we will have they will the machine will automatically select MO RO type of combination okay so why do we need specialized mammography tubes just remember that this breast tissue requires less energy okay so the optimum energy range is around 16 to 20 kilo electron volt for thin breast and for thick breast it is 20 to 24 kilo electron volt. So any X-rays which are having energy below 12.5 kilo electron volt and above 40 kilo electron volt are not optimum for this imaging. That's why we have MOMO type of tube, MO rhodium type of tube. Okay. 
so what is uh, over here you remember i said this molybdenum has a characteristic radiation at 18 kilo electron volt and 20 kilo electron volt uh, this figure is very important why just for the sake of simplicity remember this value molybdenum has characteristic radiation peaks at 18 kilo electron volt and 20 kilo electron volt okay remember this because in certain books you will find the value of molybdenum characteristic peak is 17.9 kilo electron volt and 19.5 kilo electron volt so don't remember this value to be very precise because not of that much significance just to simplify it, some standard books otherwise write it as 18 kilo electron volt and 20 kilo electron volts. So remember this thing, 18 and 20 kilo electron volt. That is for the sake of simplicity. You should remember those value. These exact values are not desirable and it becomes it creates a clutter in your mind and it is very very difficult to reproduce during the examinations. Okay. So it MO RHO type of tube is important for dense breast. Remember this much for table fiber. So this we have got combination of MO MO2 and also now in certain older tubes and nowadays there are various designs of mammography tubes which are using tungsten with palladium filter. You can remember this for thicker breast. It is good. Okay, it is cheaper also tungsten as compared to molybdenum. Okay. So why do you need in a mammography? You need a very good spatial resolution. For a spatial resolution, you need a small focal spot that is 0.6 millimeter or smaller, 0.3 millimeter, etc. And the FFD in a mammography is only 60 to 65 centimeters. Okay. So tube window, you know, it is made up of beryllium. Okay. Differences between conventional radiography and mammography, except from my book. Uh, over here, we have a operating voltage between 16 to 30 keV, and over here, it is 40 to 120. You know this molybdenum anode or target, and we have a tube window made up of beryllium, and added filtration can be of molybdenum or rhodium. Just remember this for the sake of simplicity. Let's not go into the very details. They might ask you what is rectifier. So what is rectifier? Rectifier is a device which rectifies the alternating current to a direct current. That is AC current to DC current. Remember this much, this is more than enough. What are the various types of X-ray generators? Okay, there can be single phase, triple phase, constant voltage, high frequency generator, etc. Power storage generators, capacitor battery operated. Only names are enough. Nothing more than this is required. What is automatic exposure control or photo timer? In latest uh, X-ray machines and even digital radio mammography machines, we have something known as AEC, that is automatic exposure control. So what happens over there? We have a photo timer. When a X-ray beam passes through it, the machine automatically decides how much of exposure is to be given, what is the duration of exposure that has to be given. This is more than enough for table viva. Now, what are the newer developments in X-ray tubes or what are the newer types of X-ray tubes that can be asked to you? Simply remember the names, straddle bearing anodes, spiral groups bearing, monopolar tubes, and the most important is rotating enveloped tube. Over here, we have a rotating anode type of X-ray tube, but this is rotating envelope type of tube. Over here, the whole envelope actually rotates. Okay, just names are enough. Don't go into the details of this. Now we can find a very small sheet of some metal or aluminum placed on the table viva. It can be simply asked to you or you might like to pick it up. So what is it actually? So what you will say, sir, this is a radiographic filter made up of aluminum. And if you carefully see on every, every filter, there will be a thickness of the aluminum written okay so over here it can be one millimeter of some other filter it, it is this one is 2.0 aluminum and this one also is 2.0 aluminum so this is 2.0 mm aluminum equivalent okay so you will what you will say so this is a filter no you should not say like this you should say that this is a radiographic filter of 2.0 mm aluminum equivalent that is it 
it is these are sheets of metal placed in front of the path of the x-ray beam and it absorbs the low energy radiation which helps in reducing the patient dose okay our x-ray energy of 70 kvp a total filtration of 2.5 millimeter aluminum is recommended that is it this is what you need to speak about it so what uh, does to this uh, X-ray beam, or what is the factors affecting the attenuation of the X-ray beam? So, what is the term attenuation? You should exactly remember this. Attenuation means weaken to weaken. Now we have heard about the oral polio vaccine. Oral polio vaccine is a live attenuated vaccine. So, what happens to the virus in the oral polio vaccine? The virus is live, but it is attenuated, means it is weakened. It cannot cause the disease, but it can cause the immunity to develop. So what about the X-ray at beam attenuation? We have the weakening of the X-ray beam. So when we have a high density material, say for example, iodine, barium, and a high atomic number, and a more electron density per gram, then we have increased attenuation of the X-ray beam. But if the energy of the X-ray beam is high, then the attenuation will be less as compared to a, a, a x-ray of low energy. Now there is something known as added filtration, something known as inherent filtration. You might be asked and might not be asked, but you should know that the x-ray tube as such has some component of filtration. So when x-ray pass through the x-ray tube itself and its housing, there is some attenuation of the X-ray beam. And what causes it? The glass envelope, the oil, or window in the tube housing. It is again measured in terms of aluminum equivalent. So as for example, the unit of weight is grams, kilograms. The unit of filtration is millimeters of aluminum equivalent. So generally this value is between 0.5 to 1 millimeter. For the sake of simplicity, you can remember it is 0.5 millimeter aluminum equivalent, as simple as that. Okay. So, what are the other materials which can be added for added filtration? Aluminum, as you know, generally a 2.0 aluminum sheet is used, and uh, copper you can be used as a compound filter with aluminum. Molybdenum, you know, it is used in mammography, and then we have heavy metal filters, KH filters like gadolinium, holomium, etc. Not required to be known. Names are enough. What are wedge filters? These are thicker on one side and thinner on the other side. So these are the wedge filters. Okay. And these are used to obtain films of uniform density when a part is being examined. Okay. As example in lower limb angiography. Let's take a break and try to identify this highest Olympic gold medal winner. All of you must be knowing it. You might not be remembering the name. He is a swimmer. Very well acknowledged swimmer. Michael Fell. He has got 23 gold medals and 28 Olympic medals in total. I have just shown his picture that if you focus on what you exactly want, then you can achieve your results. You need not focus everywhere. Okay. Now this TLD wedge, very important for table viva. It will always be there. You should know everything about the TLD wedge. There is no denial about its significance, importance and value in table viva. Okay. So what is it actually? So some like most of the candidates will say, sir, this is a TLD badge. In examinations, try to avoid the acronyms, try to avoid the short form. So what you should say, sir, this is a thermoluminescence dosimeter badge and it is a device for personal radiation dosimetry. It works on the principle of thermoluminescence and it consists of a white plastic cassette and inside we have a TLD card. Every quarter it is sent to the AERB accredited lab where it is read through a TLD card reader. Okay. It 
contains it consists of nickel coated this tld card consists of nickel coated with aluminum and it has a b notch at the upper end so that the orientation is correct it has got exactly three discs made up of dysprosium doped calcium sulfate each of this disc is 13.5 mm in diameter and 0.8 mm in thickness this is exactly what you need to speak in the table by bar nothing less than this addition you can always do okay the dimensions you can remember as 52.5 and 39 millimeters these filters are the uppermost filter is a metal filter made up of copper and aluminum which prevents the ga gamma radiation then we have a plastic or a perspex filter and the lower one is an open window how does this actually work i have made illustration so when alpha beta and gamma and x rays pass what happens through the open window all of this radiation pass they are registered by the disc number 3 and all rays pass okay but through the plastic window alpha rays cannot pass so rest of the beta gamma and x rays pass and through this metal filter that is copper and aluminum filter alpha and betas cannot pass only gamma and x rays can pass so that is how by measuring the exposure in the three disc we get to know about what kind of radiation the person has been exposed to so what are the other substances which can be used like lithium fluoride calcium fluoride in older tld batches but nowadays we just use one material okay where is the tld best sent it is sent every quarter that is every three month to bhava atomic research center mumbai or nowadays uh, aerb has delegated private laboratories like in this maharashtra area we have renatech laboratories where we send the tld batches to be read every quarter what is the range if the range is 0 0.1 to 2000 millisieverts so very important where do you wear the tld batch because in various books in radiopedia the this information has been incorrectly given because there are different parameters of bearing tld patch in america uk and indian india because in india we have to follow the aerb guidelines okay so the tld batch can be worn anywhere but in general the tld batch is worn at two places a chest batch and a wrist batch okay so when we only have a tld batch that is a chest batch it has to be worn at the chest level and if a lead apparent is used where will you wear it under the lead apparent remember okay because what your body is receiving is actually under the lead apparent so so over here see this uh, pamphlet from the aerb this is the tld batch and how do you wear under the lead apparent you should not wear it outside the lead apron as simple as that it has to be worn at the chest level now there are certain questions which nowadays examiners are coming up with like a person has moved to a new diagnostic center can he take his uh, tld badge over there what you're supposed to do no he should deposit his tld badge he should not use it at a new place okay and there is a form known as PD2 form. You have to send it for bark approval. And can the same TLD batch be used for two or more radiation installations? No. One institute has, is registered for the TLD batch and this TLD batch should be used in that installation only. What if you lose your TLD batch? Now, these questions were not asked earlier, but they are now being coming up. So that's why I have to include this. So if you lose TLD batch, you have to report to the uh, laboratory, say, for example, Rhinotech laboratories, so that you have lost it. Okay. And how much do you, how much do the labs charge for this TLD batch services? 
the processing fees for a TLD batch for a new TLD batch is 190 rupees plus GST. Okay. Uh, and one time registration fees is 150 rupees plus GST. GST is at the rate of 18%. This is how much you have to pay for the first time registration you have to pay 150 rupees plus GST. And then processing fees per quarter is 190 rupees per user. You should know this. Now, uh, what is this? This is also kept sometimes in some places, although it is obsolete, not used much nowadays. Some candidates say, sir, this is a wrist badge or this is a T wrist TLD badge, but it is what? It is actually a film badge. So what is a film badge? It is again, it is a radiographic device for personal radiation monitoring or personal radiation dosimetry. So this is actually a conventional type of uh, device which used to have a sealed photographic film inside a special plastic holder and there is to be six filters in this. You don't need to go into the details of this because you might not find it anywhere. So similarly it has to be used on the chest label, wrist label or the head label. Okay. So they might be asked what are the other kinds of radiation dosimetry devices. It can be a film badge, a pocket iron dosimeter, electronic dosimeter or OSL, optically stimulated luminescence dosimeter. Okay, nothing more than this is required. And this permissible dose limit. I am surprised candidates don't speak this. This is these are the must know values. So what is the annual dose limit for a radiation worker? It is 30 millisieverts in a year and 100 millisieverts over period of five years. Okay. So maximum permissible dose for a radiation worker is 30 millisieverts in a year. Remember this figure. And the equivalent dose received by skin should not exceed 500 millisieverts. And for the lens, should not exceed 150 millisieverts. And for the lady uh, worker, the radiation dose remains the same. But if a lady becomes pregnant or the pregnancy is uh, declared or she detects that she is pregnant, the equivalent dose to the embryo or the fetus should not be more than one millisievert for remainder of the pregnancy. So she has to be adequately employed. Now, I am coming on to the end of my presentation. I talked about spotters, Hosky. Residents have very obvious queries that where do we practice spotters from? There are very good high quality spotters being shown by Dr. Sanjay Yadav every day at 9.30 to 10 p.m. in his exam going PG group. It's a telegram group. All of you must join his group. Table Viva, we have a YouTube channel, Pras Radiology, which we started around five years back when IRI, ICRI, and Red Cafe and all didn't have any webinars just to help the residents. Uh, there are multiple Pras Radiology YouTube videos and how to load a cassette, how to unload a cassette, etc., which we will cover in next part of our uh, uh, lecture and Table Viva. My book, uh, Radiology Without Tears, which has received a great response from all the residents. It is one of the best books for Table Viva. And then exam cases, you must go through the Chapman differentials and my second book that is Radiology Without Tears Volume 2, which contains discussion on the exam cases. And not but the least, not but last but not the least, uh, my acknowledgement to this infinite existence, which makes us what we are especially to Dr. Samrish Sahu, who has been my teacher, my mentor during my PG days and the team of the Ruby Hall and Pune Radiological Imaging Association, my parents and all my residents, because I am not just a teacher for you. I am not here as a teacher to you. I keep learning from you and whatever I have learned, I have learned more as a resident than as a teacher. We are here with a strong sense of empathy for all of you because 
you all work so hard for these three years, but in exams, you perform equally poor because there is nobody who tells you what is going to be asked you in the examinations. You don't know how to prepare for the examinations. It doesn't mean that you're not intelligent. It doesn't mean that you've not worked hard, but simply you don't know what to be spoken in the examination, how you need to present yourself in the examinations. These are my references, Christian Sins, Fars Physics, and my own book, Volume 1. Thank you so much for your overwhelming response for my Volume 1 and Volume 2, for making my book the number one bestseller in Radiology on Amazon. It has got all the topics which are asked in Table Viva and Practical Examinations. Volume 2 largely covers all the case discussions which have been systematically arranged so that you know how to describe any pathology in a standardized manner, how to approach to a diagnosis, how to give differentials, and what are the various questions or FAQs that are asked after every examination or every case. Thank you so much for uh, any queries. Uh, Dr. Samrish Sahu will be answering the query on my behalf. I am very grateful to him. And for any request, assistance you require, you can mail me to rwtradiology at gmail.com. That is radiology without tears, rwt radiology at the gmail.com. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Do well. All the best.